There we go. Hi, Kit. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Okay. Oh, I'm so behind on this material, though. You know, I feel like I'm kind of swimming through this, like, I can go through the steps, I'm like, when do I do this versus that? And then the whole, like, I think I'm kind of starting to get the backdoor mentality of, like, the backdoor paths. Yeah. But then like the adjustment sets doesn't always match what I see, like the adjustment sets function, what I see for when I trace like the backdoor paths. So I feel like I'm, I'm kind of like groping in the dark, trying to like sort of have an idea of like what I'm dealing with. But, you know, I don't know. I'm sure if I took a test on it, <laughs> I'd get like 50% or something. So, but yeah. I watched, I watched chapter, the lesson five, lesson six. I was just like, okay, you know, trying to absorb that. I probably should go back and watch part of lesson six again, but it was a long one <laughs> and I read the chapter, right? And so it's like, okay, but we'll see. You all can critique the problems I did. I probably yeah. didn't approach it, <laughs> right? Well, I will have watched the video, but I haven't read the chapter and I haven't even looked at the problem set. So I'm way behind. Yeah, I'm trying to... I, I think I'm getting a little bit of a, I guess that I, the stuff I do is probably not as much like what we're doing right now. Um, I will say, I'm kind of glad I didn't learn linear regression like this. I think I would have felt like I was in a, a muddle, you know, yeah. um, maybe that's why they don't teach it the Bayesian way uh, to, you know, undergrads, but. It is a lot more complicated. Yeah, it's probably better theoretical underpinning. So you're not just like throwing in the kitchen sink, you know, for a regression, just being like, yeah, whatever, like, you know, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. So I'll stop talking, uh, Justin, um, Mikhail, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about it. Looks like Justin's internet is frozen. I don't know about Mikhail. Well, I just arrived, so I didn't know what you said. Okay, yeah. No, I was just kind of saying how I was feeling like I'm kind of groping in the dark a little bit, you know what I mean? Like where I sort of have an idea what I'm doing, but I'm sure if I was asked like a deep theoretical question of like, now when do you need to nest the model versus when do you not need to nest the model? Like, you know, or like how does the back, like backdoor and adjustment set. So when I feel like I'm getting different results from those kinds of um procedures you know so i i don't know i'm i'm definitely curious to have people critique the way i approached it because i definitely did not feel confident about what i was doing this time well honestly uh from the title of the book great thinking i guess it involves a lot of thinking and i guess a lot of you know unlearning all the bad habits or the bad train of thoughts that we learned throughout the years and I think that is why I find the book also difficult. So not only due to the stats and all things like that, but it really, well, mm -hmm. for me, I'm not so aware of the all these decks. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm also doing a work with um, my colleagues in epidemiology, well, not really epidemiology, but then they're think, well, if you just want to adjust it, they don't even bother drawing decks, but then they think, okay, this variable may, uh, influence the outcome and then they just include it without any bothering uh, yeah. you know uh, with, without bothering to draw the text and so on yeah yeah it's pretty eye-opening to see like you really need to have a, this, a causal model to understand which variables to put into your regression and what the coefficients mean in the results yeah, the collider, what I took away from it was like, if there's a collider, do not include that in your model. <laughs> it was like, do it so at your own peril. So I was like, okay. I want you to wonder how many colliders I've stuck in econometric regressions over the years, but you know, oh well. <laughs> yeah, I almost took it personally when Richard McCarry repeatedly said that don't be clever when you're doing your model. <laughs> so yeah, it really, yeah. I took it personally, to be honest. So you've been clever in the past? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, I kind of felt like some of the stuff he was doing was, maybe I'm misunderstanding what he means by clever, but some of it seemed a little bit clever to me. I mean, 
I don't know. I guess it depends, like I said, on how you define that word. So. Well, should we try? Oh, I guess we have still a pretty small group, huh? I think, I think we are a small group. Okay. Yeah, there were so many people that were in that first week and it's whittled down yeah. to like maybe six people, it seems like. So I don't know. Oh, well. Oh, I'm not sure how much longer I'm so. going to be able to hang on, actually. Why? Why do you think you won't be able to hang on? I'm getting more and more behind. I have not read chapter six or looked at the exercise. I haven't even looked at the chapter five exercises, actually except for what we did last week. So I'm, I'm in, I did enjoy the chapter six lecture. I thought that was interesting, but I haven't looked at the problems at all. Well, you know, one option, by the way, can, can you all hear me? My internet connection. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it seems to be good now. You were frozen, I think a little bit earlier, it looked like. At least to me, but maybe it's my internet. Um, but one option would be to pause for a week. I mean, next week, if you want to get caught up, Kent. Um, that, that would help me for sure. I don't know if other people are feeling the need for that. I'd be fine with that. I'm totally I, fine. Uh, yeah, initially, I would have been opposed to that. But there are so few of us now that if you were gone, I feel like I would just be so sad. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it'd be the two mods and me. I think Federica tends to hear about too. There's a couple other people, but yeah. So, well, we can discuss that at the end. So, if someone wants to start presenting, they have the floor. Did I sign up for? I can't. I, I add ones as I sign up, and I, I can't remember what I sign up for. You're signed up for most of them. I guess I am. Okay. Maybe one, three, and four to start. Yes. And then I took a couple other ones that I was able to write some code for, which may have been totally wrong. We'll see. So yes. Okay. I'll share my screen. Uh, so yeah. And we have, obviously we have a small group. So um please jump in if you think I did something wrong or you did something different. I want to hear, uh, want to hear your opinions about those things. So, okay. So the first question that I had, not sure if it's in the PDF or not, but list three mechanisms by which multiple regression can produce false inferences about causal effects. So I have multicollinearity, two more variables included in the model are highly correlated. Each individual variable's effect is harder to separate because they move together, or I guess they could be moving inversely, but they're still, you know, in some respect moving together. Omitted variable bias. Um, if a relevant variable is omitted from the model, the remaining variable may appear more or less effectual than it actually is. And that, if I go back to my kind of metrics class, depends on the correlation between the two variables whether the coefficient will be biased on the remaining one. Uh, included variable bias, which this was interesting because this was not, I guess it was talked about in standard econometrics classes, but I feel like omitted variable bias was much more of like, oh, you'll bias the coefficient estimate, you know, don't do it. Um, so I kind of referred to the example about the post-treatment bias, which I think, Michael, you brought up in the Slack. So I don't know if we want to, pause to talk about that. So with the treatment goal, did the plant develop fungus or not after having an antifungal treatment? And the example is included as well as the treatment status. So this can make the treatment look ineffective because it essentially includes superfluous information by including fungal status and treatment status. So once we know, already know the plant's fungal status or um, I guess treatment uh, goal of status, I guess, we don't get more info from also knowing treatment status. Um, I'm going to pause there. Anybody else interpret that question differently or think I didn't get the right three, have a different three, or want to discuss the whole included variable bias more? Well, I want to know your thoughts about the included variable bias. Yeah, for yeah that the... was a surprising one. To 
Yeah, that was a surprising one to me too. I mean, because you, what was the question you asked that couldn't you be talking about whether the treatment was actually administered successfully? And that could be what you would be including in the regression. That's great. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, it doesn't intuitively make sense to me. Um, but I guess it's like, that's not the question you're asking. The ultimate question is, is the plant taller or not? So it's almost like an indirect effect of the, I guess if you do a DAG, that would probably like kind of illustrate well, what you, we're talking about. You wanna know whether the fungal treatment makes the plant taller, right? That's mm -hmm. the fundamental question. That's a good and point, yeah. And if you control for whether it gets fungus or not, then you're basically controlling for whether it got the treatment or not. Yeah. And you're going to lose all your treatment effect. It's, well, it's assuming a, that the treatment will work 100% all the time. Well, so I, I guess so you have to be confident that an antifungal that the, works. That's one of the assumptions of the model. Well, right? if, it, if it has any effect, then it affects whether there's fungus. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what we're saying is in this question, the question, the fungal example was, we believe that the antifungal treatment consistently reduces fungus, but we're not sure that consistently reducing fungus is going to cause the plant to grow taller. I mean, you think I'm saying that right? Okay. I mean, it's basically, it's the first of his um, mask relationships. I forget just the X implies Z implies Y. And if you control for Z, then you, mm -hmm lose the effect of X on Y because- Yeah, that pipe you, relationship, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a pipe, you've broken, you've broken the relationship of X to, Z, X to Z. You've taken it out of the picture basically when you control for Z. Okay. Okay, yeah. So I was just gonna say, so my, my question for Mikhail would be, why not just run a different regression? Uh, where you regress fungus presence on treatment. Hmm. Well, that I mean, answers if, if a that, different you're question. Saying, right, but it's Mikhail's the question, question, question. of whether the treatment is effective or not. Wait, I'm right, but that's... Fungus, yeah. So if, if you yeah, yeah ask... no, no, I, I, I'm aware of that. Um, okay. But my point is that that's... Mikhail's question. Ah. Oh, I see. Sorry, could you repeat once again, Justin? Well, so it seems like you're saying that you want to include um, fungus presence in the model, or one reason you might want to is that um, I'm trying to speak slowly because I keep getting information that my in internet is unstable. So um, anyway, so you're saying that you want to know that you might include- yeah, I'm having a little hard time hearing you. you want to know if, uh, yeah, I thought so. Um, So you're, Am I you better now? Is administered properly. I can hear you okay. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you okay too. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, all right. I have a then I'll... couple of thoughts. I just saw Mikhail's question. But if you want to know if yeah. the treatment is administered properly, then yeah, maybe you want to look at the presence or absence of fungus. Well, there's two ways you, you could look at that. If you want to know if the treatment as administered affects tree height, then maybe failures in administering the treatment are, you know. Sorry, guys. I just dropped. My <laughs> connection just dropped. So, so you, your experiment, you know, if you want to know, say, if the actual field application of this treatment affects tree height, then maybe taking errors in treatment into account is valid because sometimes people will not correctly apply the treatment. Um, if, you, if you're doing a more controlled experiment and you wanna know if there's 
some trees where the treatment was applied improperly, maybe that would be a separate step to examine the fungus and maybe remove fungus. Have I lost everybody now? No, I can hear you. Okay. I can, uh, the I can hear you too. Okay, good. All the pictures went away all of a sudden. I, I turned guess. off my video because I just dropped and I don't oh. want to have my, you know what I mean, the bandwidth. I'm not yeah, sure if you can support too. It, it came back in not gallery, but okay. So if, there, if you're doing a control experiment and you want to know if the treatment was administered properly, maybe you would end up looking at the fungus and making a determination to eliminate some data points from your final regression. Um, if you really want to look at, you know, effectively applied treatment effect on tree height. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then looking at the DAX, we will block the pipe, right? Well, no, I'm saying you would, I would actually um, throw away that data. So there's two different questions. If you're trying to do a control experiment to determine if this treatment works and you want to not use, then you maybe want to not use data from any plant where the treatment wasn't correctly applied. So you might look at fungus and use that as a way to, to exclude data from your final analysis. You say, this tree, I don't think the treatment was properly applied. If your question is, does this treatment as applied in the field affect tree height, then maybe you want to leave in the errors because when it's applied in the field, people will make mistakes. Sometimes it will be applied correctly and sometimes it will not. And if, if it's never applied correctly in the field, then it's not an effective treatment, regardless of how it works in the lab. So that's my view. It's like two different questions and two different ways of handling the data. But in neither case, would you control for fungus in the final analysis of treatment effect. Mm -hmm. So I guess Justin likes that answer. I'm not sure about me, Kyle. Uh, well, I, I don't have any training in any of this stuff, so I'm making it all up as I go. Uh, I, I do know that there's actually, and I can put this in the Slack later, there's a, a really good series of causal inference lectures uh, from the epidemiology department at UPenn on Coursera. And they have one section on using instrumental variables mm -hmm. for in, in, in attention to treat effects. And I think that's maybe what Mikhail's thinking about. So I'll post that later. Um, but yeah, all right, but maybe I know I see that Laura has move on. So, so oh no, it's fine. On. I am look, I did I picked jumped around. Does anybody know that the question E2 is for one of the mechanisms, provide an example of your your choice, perhaps from your own research. You know, we have a couple researchers on this call. Um, anybody have something from their own research they want to share? I am not doing research right now, so I don't really have anything to share on that regard. Not me. Okay. Well, if you any, if anybody thinks of something, feel free to jump in. Okay, so I'll go through these easy questions uh, quickly. I'd like to go through the easy questions because it's kind of like a warm up, especially when I feel like mm -hmm. I'm marginally sure of what's going on in the chapter. So, question easy. Uh, the easy third easy question from the book was list the four elemental confounds, explain the conditional dependencies of each. So the first one is a fork. So variable Z is a common cause of both X and Y. This generates a correlation between them. Basically, if you, um, a spurious correlation, X and Y are independent conditional on Z. Pipe, which I think we referenced earlier, X affects Z and then Z affects Y. So we condition on Z, block, block that path from X to Y. So any info about X's effect on Y can be found by including Z the model. There is no direct path from X to Y. Where it gets tricky, though, is that we have a lot of these DAGs that we see in the examples, they do have a direct path from X to Y. So yeah. Uh, collider, which Dr. McElrath says is his favorite one. Um, X and Y both influence Z, but are not correlated with each other. 
So if we condition on Z, we open a path that should not exist between X and Y. So this would be the included variable bias spoken of earlier. Then descendant, which doesn't get as much mention um, that I could see in the lectures and the book. So X and I guess you could have a descendant combined with the other previous three ones. But the example in the book was, I think, a collider um, example. So X and Y both affect Z, um, and then D is a, Z affects D. So D is a descendant of Z. This is a variable influenced by another. If you condition on descendant, you partially condition on its ancestor. Um, so in this example, you would partially open the path from um, X to Y since Z is a collider. Now, I will, be say, I will say what partially open versus fully open actually means in practice. I'm not sure because, you know, if it's open, it's open, but I don't know. Maybe that's a question that's a little too nitpicky. Okay. Any I comments an, on, I think on that? I an example of that in one of the, in maybe lecture five, actually. Um, and it just means it, it reduces the um, the apparent collect connection the, between X and Y, but not as much oh, as if you conditioned on Z. The Z. Okay, so it's just it's a magnitude effect is basically what is what what you're saying. A what okay. effect? Magnitude. The magnitude yeah. is smaller. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question EC four, but I didn't copy this in, and I shouldn't. I should have. Okay, so question, um, and I realize I have not added my solutions to the folder yet, and I will. I got to clean them up <laughs> a little bit, so I will try to do that this week for previous chapters too. Um, so the question easy for in the book is how is a bias sample like conditioning on a collider? Think of the and he kind of gives a hint. Think of the example at the open of the chapter. So let's see, I wrote this uh, a few days ago. Let's see if it still makes sense to me or not. If a researcher uses a biased sample, this makes it easy to infer the variables measured in the sample are correlated with each other, given the bias of the sample. The example of only the most newsworthy and trustworthy proposals given grants because the top right corner, so to speak, is chosen. The entire sample is no association between those two factors. This makes it so that we can use chosen status as a collider and say that newsworthy affects chosen status as well as trustworthy affects chosen status. If we look at this bias sample graphically in our correlation regression analysis, we would find a non-zero non negative correlation between the two given the bias of the sample. Any comments, corrections, questions? Okay. Is that a biased sample or just a, it's a. a well, it's, bias? I mean, he calls it a bias. I guess it's just because you select on something that is not actually, or not actually correlated on like in the entire sample mm -hmm. or maybe, maybe I even see the population if we're thinking theoretically. Um, I guess there aren't that many grants out there so we could have a higher population. Um, and so you're, you're looking at that little slice and it's like, oh, look at that inverse correlation because you're conditioning on the collider of, of, cho of chosen for grant monies. Um, I can stop sharing now. I think, Mikhail, you signed up for medium one, so I don't want to hog the, the screen, or I can do mine. And if you want to go after that, it's up to you. Well, you can do yours, and then we can compare notes. That's what yeah, I thought. Did you, is it hard? You, are you using the PDF? Uh, because maybe it's different. I have no idea. I haven't checked. Mm, yeah, I'm using the PDF. OK, so maybe we'll see if it's different or not. So what I had for question medium one is modify the DAG on page 186 to include the variable V, unobserved cause of C and Y. So um, and then C, uh, V affects both C and Y. So it's kind of that fork. Reanalyze the DAG. How many paths connect X to Y, which must be closed? Which variable is you conditional on now? Okay, so I'm gonna say maybe I was a little bit lazy here and I also didn't trust myself. <laughs> so I, uh, I just um, put it into our friendly little daggity uh, uh, thing here. Okay, let me go up and 
run that. I guess I probably didn't answer all the question. I guess I should have do imply conditional dependencies. Okay, so now if we want to get the, the direct effect from X to Y, we need to condition on A. And if you take a look at page 186, if you have the PDF or the book in front of you before, you can condition on A or C. Um, but And he recommended C is the better choice because it would help the precision of the measurement of the effect from X to Y since C is the direct effect of Y. Um, and I guess that is because B, let's see, I'm trying to remember here. So V is a fork between C and Y. So now that, that path is a little bit more confusing. Um, it's trying to, I guess that you can trace those. Uh, that might be the next question. You can trace those backdoor paths and you're now, go the problem with V is though it's unobserved, right? So you can't, there's not really anything you can do to, to control for that fork. Uh, I'm sure I'm not saying this as uh, well as I could. So um, anybody want to comment? Any other intuition you had about this problem? I also have the same answer. So because okay. the, yeah, because the um, V is unobserved and we mm -hmm. cannot do anything on an unobserved variable. And indeed C is the closest to Y because we can also um, control on A, right? Because A affects uh, both U, C. So it does. Mm -hmm. But then it's further from Y. So yeah, we can just control on C instead. But it's just, it's a, it becomes a bit challenging um, in thinking about it because now that we're adding V, then mm -hmm. C becomes a collider now, but it is. Um, yeah, that's a good point. It is a collider. From, yeah, an arrow from A and C. And then, but V is unobserved. So what can we do? Because I was yeah. thinking, okay, if we control C, then are we opening a collider without us knowing? That's well, I think you would, because as you point out, if V is in the model, even if we can't measure it, right, or observe it, it is a collider. That's a very good point. And you don't want to put a collider in the model, right? We already know we can't do B for that reason, because it is, you know, a collider. Um, so yeah, I... Uh, I think I think that that's probably why now when we run we run that um, daggety function, which is or your only option is A, because that's the only one that you're not going to be introducing a collider into the equation. Okay, moving along. And then right. I kind of yeah so. I guess I was looking at more backdoor paths. Yeah, so you can see. Yeah, so I'd like what you said about Collider, Mikhail, that was better. So I, this is just me trying to reason it out of my thing without V, we could use either V, V is an unobserved fork. You're unable to estimate out the cause effect of C on Y. Yeah, so I like what you said about that. Um, you had question medium two, right? So I will stop, I did not do that one. I can stop sharing, Mikhail, if you wanna All right. take that. So I have no idea whether I'm doing it right. So yeah, just please um, check it as well. Um, okay. So I'm doing the six medium two. So, um, well, I just read the question further then. So sometimes in order to avoid multicollinearity, people can, people inspect pairwise correlations among predictors before including them in a model. And this is a bad procedure because what matters is the conditional association, not simply the uh, correlation or association among the predictors. And to, consider, to highlight this, consider the DAG X to Z to Y and simulate the data from this DAG so that correlation between X and Z is very large. And the sentence is actually a stumbling point for me because, okay, simulate data from this stack. It's a bit confusing, but I guess um, I just uh, initialize X and then first uh, sample from X to get the, my Z. That's what I, uh, what I do here. And then afterwards, he, um, the question continued to then include both in a model prediction Y. Do you observe any multicollinearity? Why or why not? 
So yeah, so looking at the DAC in the 6M2, so I have um, 100 um, uh, variables, 100 um, observations. I sampled from the normal distribution for X, and then I sampled uh, from this to get my Z, and then I sampled from, well, you could say a combination of um, Z and X um, to get my Y variable. And then if I uh, just plot the data and then yes, so this is um, X against Z, then we can see it's um, quite correlated. And then X and Y, it is also very correlated. And then afterwards, what I did is just um, fit a model um, like this. And then I get the pair plot in which everything is just correlated. And yeah, so I'm not entirely sure whether I'm doing it right because I'm just saying, yes, there's multicollinearity everywhere. So um, yeah, like in the pair plot, um, um, for the correlation among the predictors, yes, there are uh, quite a high degree of correlation. And then there is also correlation um, between the predictors and the um, and the uh, outcome. And yeah, if I sample the posterior of X and Z, yes, I can also see a correlation there. So do I misunderstand the question or yeah, do you have any other answers for this one? So I can just scroll here. I wonder if in your simulation of Y, you should not be including the X term because Y yes. is just dependent on Z directly, not on X. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I think you've yeah. added okay. another line to your um, yeah, that's true. tag by including that. Yeah, I decided to include it because yeah, I'm thinking of the uh, model. So I'm sort of trying to yeah combine the effect of um, both Z and X in which why I included both, but with um, different weights, I suppose. But yeah, so but let the me DAG, try. If... The DAG is saying just that Z affects Y, not that, that X is affects true. Y. That is true. So, oh, well, this is BRMS, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, whether we can get the answer quickly. But let's see, X and Z, it's like that. And X, X Y, it's quite yeah, the same. And yeah. Uh, you might want to change that BRM to just have Z, I guess. Um, or you could do a nested. You could do one of those models, right? Where you nest, it's nested, where it's like, um, that's a longer talk typing it out. Yeah. You know, where you do like the BF formula, uh -huh. that would be something I would think about, but I think just what we know of forks, right. The, all the effect of X on Y is felt through Z. So you probably don't even need to put it in there. Uh, that, that would be what I would think, but okay. uh, I don't know. Uh, Kent, you have a thought, but I might be wrong. So I'm just throwing it out there. That was what occurred to me. Yeah. Or Justin, or I think Ryan, I saw Ryan on the call too, anybody? So I guess I could make the model like this if, um, let's imagine if I have X and Y here, and then I have Z on top and the X connects to the, uh, connects to both Y and Z, and Z also connects to Y. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you could okay. certainly do that. Um, All right. So I think, the the issue with multicollinearity is if you um, include correlated components in your or elements in your model, correlated predictors, then the um, the coefficients are not well determined, right? That's my experience with multicollinearity. So I think he's yes. trying to show maybe that that's not always the case. So I think you have the right model of because he says include both in the model yeah well you're right i i did not even thank you <laughs> i didn't realize but then to look for multicollinearity i think that would say that there's a there's a lot of variation in the coefficient of x and z not the values but the um 
the coefficients will be um, correlated. Yeah, that does look to be pretty imprecisely measured, right? Beta x yeah. to me, if I'm looking at that right. Yeah. It looks Almost like you've, ma you've masked the um, you've, you've masked the effect of x, which is what mm -hmm. he says That's happens true. when you include the middle variable of a pipe. You Interesting. Mask out the true effect. Interestingly, it doesn't affect z really. We see it looks like z is beta z is still precisely measured, which I guess is the point of the problem. Um, yeah, and x is gone. X, yeah, x is like is really not a factor. So then the um, so then there's probably not a correlation between bx and bz if you if you sample from those. Since, or maybe there is, but just very narrow because BX doesn't vary very much. Can you can you show that? Um, which one? Sorry, I guess that's your posterior samples. Ah, um, which one? Oh no, we don't. Want, well, is that giving samples? Yeah, from the posterior. Did you refit uh, though the BRMS? I'm not sure if you've refit the VRM. I have. Oh, you did. So they are correlated, but the variation in, in BX is so small that um, it's, it's not really um, ambiguous in the way that it might be with a, that I've occasionally seen with um, correlated predictors. Do you know what I mean? They're, yes, they're correlated, but they're both in a very narrow range and one is near zero and one is near the true value. So it's not yeah. like they're really trading off a lot. The, the BX never explains the whole effect, which is what can happen if you have, um, sometimes with correlated predictors, where the, either, either one can predict the whole effect. And so the, the um, parameter, the coefficients can vary widely. So I, I don't know, I would say, well, I, didn't, what's, I haven't looked at the legs example. Can anybody say what's different from the legs example? I mean, to me, here's what, what comes to my mind in terms of the legs example is like the legs example is essentially the same variable. I mean, with a little bit of random variation because people, most people, their leg length isn't exactly the same. Um, here we have, I think, is it Z is a fun, yeah, Z is like a function of X, right? In a way that, I, I mean, I guess, well, maybe I guess you could say your right leg is a function of your left legs. So it's probably gonna be within a pretty narrow range. Uh, well, just looking at the plot on page 165 the, on the left, figure one, 6.2, the, um, there, so there the parameters are both varying over a wide range. Or if you look at the, um, the forest plot on page 164, whereas if you did a forest plot of this uh, regression, they wouldn't have that overlap. So it would be different in that way. I don't know if you can do that easily. I was just gonna say um, that that uh, the the DAG would be completely different for this example and the leg example. The leg example is not uh, a pipe. It's not that causally. It's not that right leg influences left leg or vice versa. It's that they're both uh, measurements yeah. of mm -hmm. like latent leg length. <laughs> you have latent yeah, leg like length. genetics or something. Yeah, or you're just height or something something we could another another variable yeah that's a really good point yeah so maybe so i guess in that case maybe all three are measurements height right length right leg length and left leg length are like all tapping into vertical displacement you can call that so so more of a fork kind of a thing if you think about it right because presumably that latent whatever you're calling yeah. latent leg leg would affect both right and left legs height and then both of those would technically what was it effect? What was yeah. the like, like an example forked, height? Uh, forked from an unobserved variable. Mm, yeah. On page 163, that's exactly how that model is constructed. 
leg left and leg right are both related to leg prop, which is the unobserved variable. So it's interesting because he says, look, just looking for correlation is a bad procedure, but actually in this case, it would give the right result because in a pipe, we don't want to include Z in the model. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't have, and it has a bad effect to include it. So if you looked for um, correlation, well, I suppose if you were just looking for correlation, I don't know if you would pick X or Z as the variable to include in the model. Um, but if you're trying to predict Y from X, you would include X. Well, isn't that the point of the DAG? It's kind of where it's like, if you have a good DAG, you would know to include you know, C and not X, I guess, or an accurate DAG, I should say. Well, in this case, you want to include X and not C. What I'm saying is- I think you want to include, um, I, well, I don't know. Depending on what you're trying to predict, I guess. Hmm, and if you're trying to find the effect of X on Y, then you would leave out Z. Because I guess that's, fa that's fair. And if you were using the heuristic of um, don't, don't include correlated variables, you would also leave out Z. Um, so it's interesting that the heuristic gives the right result, even though it has a different, a little bit different effect to include, including Z has a different effect here than in the legs model. Does that make sense? I kind of think nobody's getting my point. Maybe I should drop it. No, no, I think your point is good. So I actually was very, so he makes that point a few times, I think. Well, mainly most, mostly in the multicollinearity part. Um, and, and so, yeah, so he keeps making the point that it's not the raw pairwise correlations that matter. It's their core, their conditional correlations that matter. And so I was hoping that this example would show, like, I think the cleanest example of that would be one, a data set where the raw correlations are not high. So, you know, you just see two variables correlated at, I don't know, 0.3. You think, oh, there's no multicollinearity there. And then somehow including, you know, a third variable shows that they actually do have really high conditional uh, correlations. That's what I was hoping to see because that's the point that he seems to be making. And then uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really get made because there is a very high raw pairwise correlation between, um, what x and x and z in this example. So, so I have to admit that this point hasn't fully sunken in for me. Or I mean, I, I can like repeat, I can pare back the words, but uh, I don't have like a new strong intuition in my head yet. Should we proceed and leave it for the time being? Sounds good. All right. So I have to unshare and then share my PDF. Okay. Um, Dax again. So, um, so the idea is to analyze each of the four Dax and can, can you uh, make that smaller? It's very clipped, very clipped off on the edges. Oh, um, like this. There we go. That's All right. Good. Okay. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So we analyzed um each of the four tags and then de determine which um variable that we have to adjust if we have to to estimate the total uh, causal influence of x on y. Okay, so I will go um, through the tags one by one. So in this example, what I'm saying is that Z is a confounder because it affects uh, both X 
and why. And I think just by blocking on um, Z alone, then we can um, block this part. And we don't have to bother about A because, well, I think, um, yeah, if we cut, if we block this path, then uh, A will not be able to affect um, X as well. So I think by blocking Z, then it's um, enough. By adjusting on Z, it's enough. Okay. And then the, um, for the second example, now it's changed to, okay, so now Z becomes a collider here because it received arrow from both X and A. So I don't think we uh, should condition it. But then I'm, yeah, I'm a bit confused. Okay, should we condition on A because now, yeah, um, if we condition, yeah, but I guess we don't have to condition on any variable in this example, because yeah, that's what the DAG function says. Yeah, I think that's right because Z is a is a pipe and A is a fork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And then uh, the third example. Okay, for this one. Uh, yeah, now I, Z again is a collider. However, we see um, that A and X, uh, well, A is um, associated with both X and Z, but again, because Z is uh, blocking the path, then I don't think we need to adjust on anything here. But it becomes different in the for example, because okay. now A I can find a way to Y, Oh, sorry, Ken. Don't you want to condition on Z because it's a collider? You don't want to condition, yeah. You don't want to. Yeah. So, yeah, the Daggety right. function for the third one, it says you can't, you shouldn't condition on anything, basically. That's what I found. So I think, Mikhail, your intuition there was correct. Right, right. Okay. Getting the fork and the collider confused. Yeah. And the fourth one, well, now A can find the path to Y. Um, so A to Z to Y. And A also um, associated with X. Then I think by adjusting on um, A, um, or, yeah, so in this part, I'm not entirely sure whether I should adjust the A because it affects both um, X and Y, or we can just adjust the X, adjust the Z because it will block it uh, anyway, um, I think you want to do and it's a closer to Y. Z is, but Z is a pipe, and you don't want to condition on a pipe. Yeah, that's true. Because X does influence Y through Z. Yeah, that's true. So a condition on A then. Yeah, that's I. That's what the Daggety function says. I will say though, but if I mean, I guess I guess you want to get the total effect of X on Z or on Y. I'm sorry, but I guess that doesn't make sense to me. I'm trying to like think this through because it's like if you want to just get that direct effect and not the effect through Z, isn't that what regression is trying to separate out? But maybe I'm looking at this all wrong. Well, no, this is the difference between the total effect and the direct effect. Okay. So, if you wanted the direct effect, you would condition on Z, but if you want the total effect, you have to leave Z. Okay. So if you want to estimate the total- Oh, you're influence. right, it does say total causal influence. I think yeah. I need to read better. <laughs> I need to read the question more carefully. Okay, so we really need to preserve the both the direct path and the indirect path from X to Y then, if this is the question. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so I, um, I guess I'll share a couple hard ones. Uh, I'll try to go through these quickly. Okay, so um, I should have copied. I don't, did you guys have the foxes in the PDF? Was that uh, one of the problems? is so they have this foxes data set which is about like urban foxes um 
from 30 different urban groups in England. So he says the foxes are like street gangs, group size, <laughs> which kind of made me laugh. Group size varies from two to eight foxes. Each maintains its own urban territory. Some territories are larger than others. There's the area variable encod encodes the information. Um, some territories also have more average food than others. We want to model the weight of each fox. So there's a DAG, um, which is uh, basically area affects average food. Average food directly affects weight. Average food also affects group size. Then group size affects weight. So um, pulling in the FOXES data here, standardizing everything. Everything has an S at the end. And I dropped any NAs. There weren't any NAs, but just to make certain. So here's the DAG that I was talking about. And it's probably easier to see if you look at the, but I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna uh, look at that. Um, so area affects average food, affects, which affects group size, which affects weight. And then we also have average food affects weight. Um, let's see, I'll run this. So adjustment sets or interested in the, so question three says, use the model to infer the total causal influence of area on weight. And as I'm reading this, I realize I've probably been re reading the question wrong, total causal, not the direct causal. Would increasing the area available to each fox make it heavier or basically have more weight, which I guess for a fox is healthier. Um, you might want to standardize variables, which we did. Regardless, use prior predictive simulation to show that your model's prior prediction stay within the possible outcome range. Okay, so adjustment sets, uh, you can see nothing, um, which is, I guess, not surprising given what we've been talking about. And then also I decided to look at conditional dependencies, areas independent of group size, conditional and average food. So a lot of this is all conditional and average food, right? Areas independent of weight, conditional and average food. So we definitely don't wanna include average food in the, um, so yeah, I kind of summarize that there. Don't expect a strong predictive value given the pipe relationship. I guess you could say it's transferred through average food, but given the examples. So then um, here's and that beer. So, so why are you including? Oh no, you didn't, I guess. I just was looking at your text. You said yeah. you we're gonna include average food in the model. Maybe I try I think I might have tried yeah. that just to prove to myself, but I think I'm getting a little more clarity as I'm talking and understanding total causal influence is not like direct causal influence, which I guess I should have realized that because English, because that's how English works, but for whatever reason, I didn't. Um, anyways, so you can see it's a the sample prior allows you to do that. So then I, now we have the posterior summary. Um, even if my intuition wasn't necessarily uh, good, it seems like this is a pretty imprecisely measured uh, beta right there. Not, you can look at the, the quantiles here. It's right around zero. Okay, so then what I did is I used a, something from the tidyverse book um, and you can use expand. This is kind of an interesting thing with expand and nesting. I hadn't done that before. So then you're kind of generating based on your what you're sampling from that prior distribution. Keep in mind, not the posterior. And then just a couple of different, two, di two distributions above, two distributions below the mean for area. And then, you know, you can change the color if you want. I didn't, uh, let me scroll up there a little bit. Oh gosh. It's prior samples, it's deprecated, whatever. Okay, so here's our prior predicted distribution. It's not crazy. I mean, it could be a little tighter, but I was like, that seems reasonable to me. Um, any questions about that? Any corrections, things you would have done differently, ways you interpreted the question um, differently and possibly more accurately than I did? No, I think it's right, it's interesting. So. Presumably area increases average food, which increases group size rather than mm -hmm. increasing the weight of the individuals. Yeah, and actually if we're gonna looking at, um, I did some stuff in four where it's average food, yeah, the average food and group size are definitely the ones that are 
you know, having that impact. So we'll see that. Okay. Um, so now question four, based on that same data. Now and for the causal impact, I'm assuming he means total causal impact. Um, maybe I shouldn't assume that. I don't know of adding food to a territory. So I guess that's just if like somebody randomly just was like dropping some food in for a certain territory to fox if somehow you knew what their territory was. Would this make foxes heavier? Um, which covariates you need to adjust for to estimate the total causal influence of food? So yeah, I might not have done this accurately, but it'll be interesting to see my, you don't need to adjust for anything um, based on this empty set. And then I just wanted to remind myself of the implied conditional dependencies, right? So I just kind of, so I was kind of going, this is kind of a note to myself, entirely makes sense to me. Previously with similar DAG, we did include with A&M in the regression. So just to kind of look at this for myself. I was creating a model with just a, of average food and then um, G, which I think was group size and average food. So probably didn't need to do all this, but I kind of wanted to sh think about this myself, you know, so. Uh, here we go. I didn't need to sample the prior here, but I did because I don't know, I guess maybe I would have done something with it. Um, though this is, in, okay, this is interesting. This is kind of that masked relationship, I think that phenomena. So, um, which we talked about in chapter five. And so this is really like imprecisely, right? The effect zero is like right in the center of that distribution. I know we're not supposed to talk about point estimates too much for Bayesian. So that was kind of interesting to me. Okay, well, um, so the middle of the distribution is around zero. So now I just thought, hey, I'm gonna put in both because I want to kind of, you know, look at that. Possibly should not have been doing this, but whatever. And so now we see that I don't know anything about foxes. So if anybody is knows about them and has a, a comment, um, now we see that average food is certainly a lot. This is a pot. We see that is precisely measured when we kind of look at that direct effect more, um, not just through media, through group size. And then not surprisingly, we have group size as a strong negative effect. So I guess it's like more foxes, fewer, there's, you know, less food to go around or, or maybe let's see we're seeing average food impacts group size i'm trying to there's a negative um so group size have a negative impact on weight average food has an impact on group size so yeah i kind of thinking through that anybody have any insight into fox behavior uh, or so, that would so what you're saying the b the average food size coefficient is saying for a given group size mm -hmm. If you increase yeah. the food, then the weight will increase, which totally makes sense. Uh, for a given, yes, that's right. However, for a given for a given food, and then if you de if you increase the group size, it will the weight will go down. Which I guess is saying, which hey, also it makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah, more foxes for the same amount of food. food. Can yeah, be smaller foxes. Okay, so this is kind of interesting to me. Masking relationship, possibly, possibly not. I don't know. I'm going to try to. I know we're close to time, so I'm kind of going. So I just wanted to do a nested model here. And this is probably, maybe I shouldn't have been doing this, but this is kind of an interesting thing to think about, right? Because we already knew like area really, like that effect, that total effect is very small. So I'm not even really totally thinking about that. Um, and maybe I could, I probably should have, but I can go back and adjust this, I guess. So I, this is kind of what I'm doing here. Um, if you remember those from the previous, so we have all this stuff. And then I guess I was looking at that. So not surprisingly, right, these are almost exactly the same, which is interesting. And then average food size, average, let's see, average food, the impact on uh, group size was positive, uh, which I guess makes sense to me. In fact, a pretty narrow interval here, right, if we look at those quantiles. So the idea being, hey, um, you increase the food, more foxes want to join the group because they can all have the food, I guess. Anybody have another interpretation of that? Okay. No, I don't understand then what the model is here. 
you don't understand the model. Yeah, if you take a look at the PDF, maybe it will make sense. It wasn't as much intuitive to me as like the waffle divorce one because, you know, that's a, I guess I just don't have so much intuition about Fox behavior. Um, so I was just trying to separate out basically the effect, um, looking at the effect of group size on food. I'm sorry, vice versa. <laughs> Okay, um, any comments? I kind of had rushed through that a little bit. I apologize for that, but time considerations. And I'm not saying you should have done all of this. This is kind of my, some of this was more just me demonstrating things to myself and some curiosity, I guess. Um, now it's time now. It's already a uh, one plus. So um, what should we do for next week then? I guess I would um, actually propose that we can just uh, meet and maybe discuss whatever that we um, want to discuss. But then after, if we, let's say after 30 minutes, then we don't have anything more to say, then we can just end the meeting early. I guess it's better to maintain the consistency of the meeting, but then of course, just uh, remove an expectation that everyone has to do something uh, for the next meeting. How would that sound? I think it's good to keep the meeting and just have it as a general discussion and catch up time. Yeah, yeah. I'm up for that. I, I, I need, I want to go back and watch the causal inference lecture for, I didn't, I have not watched that. And I wonder if that will kind of clear things up some in my mind. Maybe watch lecture six, at least part of it again, too. Yeah, I totally underestimate the load that is required. And, you know, watching the videos and then reading the books and then reading the BRMS translation, it's a lot of things. And yeah. It's... I'm, just, I'm just amazed at these college students who are doing like three <laughs> chapters a week. It's like, yeah. I guess that that's what happens when you don't, you aren't a graduate student or employed full time or have a family or, you know, have, if you have all your time to just devote to like attending classes and not having other things that you need to do. So. All right. So we'll see you next week then. Yeah. That's good. See you next week. Great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.